Thank you, Jerry, for that reading. Am I on? I can't hear, so I can't tell. All right, good, good. Yeah, thank you, Jerry, for that reading. And thank you, everybody, for singing out. Thank you, Phil, for those songs. Thank you, uh, Chris, for the prayer. Thank you, Darren, for helping us as we remember the risen Christ. And hopefully always take those times to think about our own lives and to be confessional to God and to rededicate ourselves to Him. That's part of what that is every week. It's a remembrance <clears throat> and it's a rededication of our lives and our commitment to the God who's given us all things at great cost for our own good. Please give your attention this morning to a reading from the Word of the Lord. This is from Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 25. Luke chapter 14, starting verse 25. Now great crowds accompanied Jesus, and He turned and said to them, If anyone comes to Me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be My disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me, cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. The word of the Lord. So again, good morning, church family and friends. I want to ask you, <clears throat> especially on the heels of such a, such a challenging teaching from Jesus, do you believe in the God of the Bible? If you do, say amen. Do you love His Son, Jesus, who was crucified and raised from the dead in order to give us access to the saving grace of God? If you do, say Amen. The question then Jesus asks us is if we love Him enough to live daily as a disciple, understanding that that means His call to us is to be willing to give up everything in order to please Him and to advance His mission to seek the lost who are seeking Him. And if you do, if you love Him that much, where you're willing to examine your, yourself and your life and your blessings and to count the cost of discipleship, if you love Him enough to follow Him day by day, understanding that requires real self-denial and carrying an actual burden, an actual cross, then Jesus asks us to count the cost. And you know how hard those sacrifices can be. You know how heavy that cross can be. And what a struggle it means when we try to follow Jesus, not just in the easy times when all is well, but in the hard times when it isn't, when God doesn't feel quite so close. When we look around and we see what appear to be great blessings in the lives of others, and maybe our cupboard feels barren. We know that we see these stories over and over again in Scripture. We remember the prayers of those like Abraham, or Abram and Sarai before God renames them for a child, for an heir, and how they, they had to wait years and years and years. We remember the story of, of a man such as Joseph, a man loved, beloved by his father, yet sold off into slavery by his brothers, who ends up in a foreign land in prison for years and years and years before God's will and work are finally re resolved and re revealed in his life. 
We think about the countless stories we could recount this morning in Scripture of people like that. And so I want us to take the time this morning to to look at one of them. And I hope in part that what this does is reminds us that you and I are not alone in the battles that we face, in the trials that we endure, in the longing and the suffering and the waiting for the revelation of the victory of God. But we're in it together. It's part of why God gives us this, this church, this time, this opportunity to be part of a spiritual family who lifts each other up, who helps to carry each other along, and who does what we see the early church doing. If you, if you read your daily prayer guide this morning from the book of Acts, when God's people gathered together at every opportunity they had to share and to be devoted to those good things they learned in Christ that were reaffirmed through the teaching of his servants, the apostles. So again, I want us to see one example in Scripture today that gives us, I hope, strength and and the assurance of God's faithfulness toward the righteous. To do that, I hope you will turn with me now to the Old Testament, to the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel, where in chapter 1, we find the story of a great woman of faith, a great woman of dedication named Hannah. And as I read you her story this morning, I want want you to think about her faith. And I want you to think about her devotion to the Lord. And I want you to think about the incredible sacrifice that that great woman made because she believed in God. And then I want you to ask yourself a question. Was it worth it? Did she do the right thing? Did God truly bless her? And was her life and the world around her made better because of her faithfulness? And might God be calling you to something similar today? 1 Samuel chapter 1. Now there was a certain man of Ramathim Zophim of the hill country of Ephraim whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jeraham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, and Ephrathite. And he had two wives, and the name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh. And you might think, well, why not Jerusalem? Well, because there was no temple in Jerusalem. These are, this is in the days well before there were kings in Israel. But there at Shiloh were the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, who were priests of the Lord. And on the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penanah his wife, and all of her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion, because he loved her, even though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival, this is the other wife, Penina, Hannah's rival used to provoke her grievously, to irritate her, because the Lord had closed her womb. You see, in the ancient world, Uh, it was incredibly significant, important to the ongoing of the family to bear children. And that was in that world, and then that patriarchal society continued or considered the primary responsibility of the wife was to provide heirs for her husband. And so to have your womb closed as it was in in their understanding by the Lord meant that something was wrong with you, that God was punishing you. And can you imagine carrying that sort of stigma all the time? that you're a failure, that you're useless, that you are less, and that it's because God has decided that fate for you. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, 
said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? And I see the women in the room rolling their eyes thinking, sound just like a husband. (laughs) And after they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. And now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. And she was deeply distressed. And she prayed to the Lord. And wept bitterly. Have you you ever been that upset before the Lord? Have you ever spent your time in prayer like that, like Jesus did in the garden? Weeping? And so she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, that's the first time, by the way, we read of that description of God in all of Scripture. O Lord of hosts, you who are the mighty commander of the armies, the celestial beings of the heavens. O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. And as she continued praying before the Lord, Eli, remember this is the priest there in Shiloh, Eli observed her mouth and Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, How long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I'm a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I've been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman. For all along I've been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Man, can you hear the pain in her voice? Don't think of me as worthless when everybody else does. Then Eli answered her and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your eyes. And then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. They rose early in the morning and they worshipped before the Lord. And then they went back to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife. And for the grown-ups in the room, you know what that means. He knew her in a way that a husband alone is supposed to know his wife. And the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived And bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. Have any of you ever had an experience like that? Where you have been in such distress for some answer from God, for some gift from God, for some healing from God, for some salvation from God, for some Something from God. Week after month after year. And then finally God grants it. Have you ever experienced that? And known the relief and the joy and the sense that God does love me. God has heard me. If you've ever experienced anything like that, then you can have some sense of what this great joy for Hannah must have been when she felt that baby start to grow. And she felt him move and kick. And you know she must have prayed every single day, God, God, let this child come to term. Let, let this child be born healthy and whole. Let this child be a son that she had prayed for from the beginning. And indeed, he came forth a son. Can you imagine how much Hannah loved that boy?
What is the one thing in your life that you love more than anything else? There are many things that if God asks of us and says, come and give that to me, give that to my service, give that to my mission, dedicate that to the advancement and to the growth of my kingdom. There are many, many things you might give. If God himself spoke to you and said, today you're taking the bus home because I need your car. Would you give it? You probably would if God himself asked for it. If God himself said, I know you've got a good job and you make a lot of money, but man, where, you're only here once a week, once a month. I need you here more often. Take the demotion. Give that time to me. If God asked you for it, would you give it? If God himself asked, you'd probably give it. But what about that one thing? If you had to make a list of all the things that God has given you and blessed you with, all of them, and you had to rank them in order, yeah, I give this to God, no problem. Yep, God, no problem. God, no problem. But eventually, there's going to be something at the end of that list that's like the very last thing you'd be willing to give. What about that thing? Because the, as much as you love that thing, that's how much Hannah loved her son. And the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, As soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord establish his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine. And she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And the child was young. And then they slaughtered the bull and they brought the child to Eli. And she said, Oh, my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who was standing here in your presence, praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. And Hannah prayed. And she said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord. There is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by Him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. You almost hear in this later Jesus' own ministry when he speaks to the multitude on the mountainside, those things we call the Beatitudes that sound counterintuitive. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the poor. But how God reverses the fortunes, how God flips things upside down, turns them inside out, because we have a God alone who can do that. Amen? We have a God who raises the dead. Amen? And we hear those early, those early stirs of those understandings in this ancient song, this ancient prayer of Hannah. The barren, she says, has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. 
The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap. If you heard Jerry's scripture reading this morning from Psalm 113, later, generations later, the psalmist himself borrows these words from Hannah and uses them again as he rejoices in the goodness of his God. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them He has set the world. He will guard the feet of His faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail, but the adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces, and against them He will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to His King And exalt the power of his anointed. And then Elkanah went home to Ramah. And the boy ministered to the Lord in the presence of Eli the priest. How in the world could Hannah do that? How could she give up the one thing that she wanted more than anything else in the world? Well, first she understood that she wasn't giving him up. She wasn't abandoning him. Abandoning him. She wasn't casting him aside. But as the text itself says, she lent him to the Lord all the days of his life. Hannah understood that she was investing him. That she was entrusting him to the Lord God who had answered her prayer. To the Lord God who had opened her womb. To the Lord God who was king of the heavens in the earth. She wasn't giving him away. She was giving him to God for his own good. And she was wise enough to understand that the God who had answered her prayer is trustworthy and true. That he is faithful always. And so why wouldn't she want her son to minister to that God? To live in that God's care and service. And if you continue to read in that book of 1 Samuel, you'll learn that that he indeed stayed there and ministered to Eli and that she used to go up year by year to see her son. Because she always loved him. And that he did indeed grow up to be a great man in God's service. Later in that chapter, in 1 Samuel chapter 2, in verse 26, it says, Now the boy Samuel continued to grow, both in stature and in favor with the Lord, and also with men. Does that sound familiar? It ought to. Because if you've read in the Gospels the story of Jesus, in Luke chapter 2, verse 52, it says almost the exact same thing about Jesus, born to Mary. Son of God. This Samuel grows up to be a great prophet of God who is used by God to establish the kingship in Israel. It's interesting, at the end there of Hannah's prayer and her song, she speaks of the establishment, of the dedication of the king. She speaks of it in a time where there is no king. Israel has no king. It's never had a king but God. But in her prayer, she is prophetic in a sense. And and how beautiful it is that a kingship that doesn't exist when she prays those words, that didn't exist when she prayed to God that her womb might be opened, will later exist because her son, who she gives to God and to his service, grows up to be a great priest who God himself chooses to anoint a man in Israel named Saul, who is the first Israelite king. And when Saul falls out of favor with God, God sends this man again 
to go and anoint his replacement. And this time, by the direction of God, he anoints a young boy named David, who becomes the great king of Israel, anointed by Samuel. And David, this great king in Israel, becomes an ancestor, a forefather of the true king of heaven and earth, whose name is Jesus, who was born in the same town Samuel was born, his mother, Anna. Did Hannah know that all of that was going to happen while she was still barren and praying for a child? How could she? Do you and I know what God is going to do with us, with our gifts that we offer in dedication to Him? How can we? We can't see the future any more than she could. But we ought to know, as well as Hannah knew, that God knows and that God is faithful. We ought to know as Hannah did when she made that vow, that dedication that if you will give me a son, I will dedicate to him to you all the days of his life. We ought to know as as concretely as she did that God never wastes our offering to him. Amen? God never wastes or looks down on your sacrifice. Do you remember the time Jesus is with his disciples and they're standing outside the temple? And there's the money box. Where everybody comes and makes their offering. Do you remember that story? And it said they they watched people come and and some brought great loads and made a big show, I'm sure. They they brought it all in ones, Jose. They could have just brought a 20, but they brought it all in ones and put them in one at a time. That's how I imagine it. So everybody would see. And then Jesus watched this, I imagine this little hunchbacked woman. And she drops two little copper coins. And he points her out. Above all the rest. And he says, see this woman? She gave more than all the rest. Because she gave everything she had. Her name ought to have been Hannah. So what do you love? More than anything else. In all the world. I challenge you this morning to follow the example of Scripture and give it to God. We talk about giving God our pain and we talk about giving God our stress. We talk about giving God our worry and our fear and our needs and that's appropriate. Scripture teaches us to do that. But it also teaches us to give God our best Our first fruits. The things that we love more than anything else. God told Abraham to take Isaac, the son he loved. The son that he had been promised. God told Abraham to take Isaac up the mountain and sacrifice him there. Do you remember that story? It's in Genesis chapter 22. The son of promise, the son of covenant. If there was ever a time a man could say, no, God, because you promised him to me. But Abraham, in his sorrow, took him in faith. He took him up the mountain, built an altar, laid the wood on it, bound the hands of his son, laid him on it, drew his knife to slay his son because God had called for him. But God saw his faith and stopped his hand, and saved his son. And he declared Abraham a righteous man, because he was willing to give to God the thing he loved more than anything else in the world. Or consider how God himself so loved the world that he gave his only son. How he sent Jesus to be born in Bethlehem, a peasant. 
to be raised up and misunderstood, mistreated, maligned, and crucified. Because He loved us. And gave the best He had to give for us. Because God knew that in that giving, that the loss and the grief and the pain and the sorrow that Jesus would experience, both in His life and in His death, God knew that those were temporary things. That death could not hold Him. As Darren read to us this morning from Acts chapter 2. And that's also how we should think of the sacrifices God calls us to make. That these are temporary things. And that again, when we give them up, we're not really giving them away. It's not as if we're throwing them away. But instead we're handing them over to God. Who will carry them gently and lovingly and protectively. And that God will put anything you are able to give to Him to good use for the further establishment of His kingdom. To further seek and save those who are lost. To further bind up the wounded. To heal the brokenhearted. To lift up the poor and the needy. To exalt those who humble themselves. To raise the sorrowful up out of the ash heap. And to give the barren woman a home. Making her the joyous mother of children. That's the God we lend ourselves and our things to. And that's how we should think of the things that we are called to give over to God. As sacrifices. As investments that God will use for His mission. Hannah and Samuel are not just a story. But they're a lesson for us. They are a call to us to be faithful and devoted. They're a reminder to us of how God works generationally through the choices we make today. Hannah's choice had to be painful. It had to be hard. It, maybe she didn't. But I've made vows to God that when the time came to pay up, I gave it a second thought. Have you ever done that? But Hannah was faithful. And she followed through. And what an example she is for us today. What do you love the most? Will you give it to God for His service? If it's your money, give it to God. If we all doubled our contributions this year, you know we could come close to paying off the mortgage on this building. What a generational gift that would be to God's mission in New England. And you think, double my contribution? What do you love the most? If it's your children, give them to God. Bring them here for worship. Keep them here for our classes. Bring them back on Wednesdays. Let them fellowship with others who, who are growing up in the grace and knowledge of God. Pray with them at home. Be a godly example under your own roof. None of us are perfect. We all make mistakes. But make an effort for them to dedicate yourself to the Lord. What a blessing that would be in the lives of your children and in the lives of their children and their children's children. What do you love most in the world? What do you cling to most tightly? If it's your time, give it to God. Clear your calendar so that God gets pride of place. Don't think of opportunities to worship and learn and serve as things that you can fit in here and there if you have time. You have time as long as God gives it. And when He decides your time is done, it's done. You don't get to choose. God does. So let's not be foolish and pretend that it's ours. But instead of fitting God in, fit everything else in around Him. Our calendars tend to reflect our priorities in this life as much as anything else. Whatever it is, 
that you value the most. Give it to God. Pray about it. Be faithful and courageous. And trust that God will not leave you empty. That God will not leave you alone. Because He is still the God, as Hannah prayed, who gives the barren woman a home and makes her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. Let's pray together. Our God in heaven, we thank you for the examples you show us in Scripture that you use to teach us. Examples like this one of Hannah. Well, we would love to know more about her. We would love to have met her and can look forward excitedly about that time when, when your son returns to put an end to all the evil and the pain and the death in the world and to make all things new. Because we know, God, that not only will our lives uh, be better than they ever could be in this place when that day comes, when the new heaven and earth come together, where we worship you, see you, and are loved by you face to face. But we know, Lord, that we'll also be united with all of the righteous, all of your saints who've ever lived. And that we, we might even in that day get to hear the story of Hannah from her own lips. But Lord, we're thankful that you have saved her story for us. We're thankful, God, because we see that the choice she made, the sacrifice she made, went on to bless countless generations, including us. Dear Lord, we can't know what exactly you have in mind for us, for our children, or our grandchildren. We can't know precisely what you intend for this church and this place. And so we ask you to continue to use us. We ask you to help us to be faithful and strong and courageous, to never be afraid, knowing that you are with us every single day. We ask you, Lord, as Paul taught us, to continually, to every single day, get up and put on the armor of God so that we could be strong and stand firm against the wiles and the attacks of the devil. Lord, we ask you to give us grace and mercy and comfort and peace. We ask you to give us a passion for your house, zeal for your mission, just as your son displayed in his life and ministry. We ask you, God, that you will walk with us in every way so that we might be able to be as faithful as Hannah. And to be honest with ourselves about the things in our life that we value the most. Instead of clinging to those things, God, as idols, we ask that we will sacrifice them to your service, dedicate them to you, lend and invest in you and in your purpose for us. Trusting that you will not leave us alone and that you will not turn us away and that you will not let us shrink off empty, but that you will raise us up and give us a place in your house, in your kingdom, so that our lives have meaning both today and tomorrow and until the end when your son returns. Dear God, it's for his return that we pray, asking for every blessing from you in his name. In the name of Jesus, let the church say, Amen. If we can be of help or blessing to you, if you need the prayers of the congregation, or if you need to give yourself to God by confessing his Son as Lord in Christ and being baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins, there is no better time to do that than now. No better time ever than today. And so we invite you, whatever your need might be, to come as we stand together and sing. I must needs go.